It shows that you still think it's risque. Like, yes. And also, like, the idea that, uh, I don't know, there's an audience. Like, this is why I think privilege always comes back in one way or another to, like, money. It's like, because they will always, always, always assume that the primary audience is who? It's going to be straight white men. Yeah. Because they have to make these huge movies for everyone. And what that really means is that it has to appeal to straight white men the most. Somebody was talking about that recently. They were like, well, worldwide, and that's where a lot of movies are making their money now. Yeah. Statistically, the most average human being would be what? A Han Chinese? It would be a Han Chinese gender fluid person because the average number of uh, men and women fluctuates each year. So the majority gender switches. So you need a... Han Chinese person whose gender depend <laughs> changes depending on statistics. I mean, that is going to change our movies. Yeah. It might, it'll probably, because studios are stupid, make them yeah. incomprehensible. <laughs> but maybe that'll be interesting too. Who knows? Uh, Just like, oh my God, the, the true future of CGI is when you can change the character of your movie just by pressing a button and it like changes every digital like, copy of the movie. Like the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus or whatever. Yeah. Heath Ledger dies, then it was like, Terry Gilliam's like, well, let's make this character uh, Johnny Depp and, uh, and um, who else? Who else are we going to get? Who's the Colin Farrell? We'll make him Colin Farrell too. And then we'll make him five different people over the course of the movie. No, I'm just saying like it retroactively changes the character to based on like, what they think will sell best. Oh my God. Time. I can't wait for that. And it's dependent <laughs> upon your ads. Yeah. Oh man. There's no creative media anymore. It's just, yes, like, it's just whatever you want. There's nothing about it. Yeah. But anyway, well, Max, let me say something right now. Okay. You mentioned Luke earlier and specifically a little bit of incest with Luke Skywalker. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Dive into that already. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, if we're going to talk about like people wanting to fuck their sister, sort of, that's a pretty good segue. I think (laughs) into today, today's movie on the spectator film podcast. Is that your Scarface impression? (laughs) That was my flourish for that. (laughs) Uh, But today's movie is Scarface. The good one. Scarface. 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 I know, he's Scarface. He's the best at scarfs. Um, oh, I was thinking more like he scarfs food down. Scarface. No, Scarface. Um, well, anyway, I'm Austin. <laughs> I'm the one with the jokes, obviously. I'm Max. I'm the one with the shit posts. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're doing the 1932 <laughs> film Scarface. So for all of you looking for your Al Pacino fix, get the fuck out of here now. I, I mean, we could probably do that one at some point. I don't want We're going to need some cocaine for it, though, so... Yeah. Patreon, folks. <laughs> Patreon. Uh, but if yes. If you want to fund our comical pile of cocaine, then we'll need to watch Scarface. <laughs> just be sitting in it. There's just going to be two microphones poking out of like, it's just the whole room of, is full of it. But anyway. Okay. That's so not what we're Just a real, just a real right quick now. thing. Um, quick disclaimer. We heard the Spectator Film Podcast do not advocate drug use, nor do we publicly admit to doing any drugs. But a close friend of mine, um, I didn't realize like, cause when I saw yeah, the, the Al Pacino Scarface when I was younger, I think I was like 12 or something. I was playing at my friend's house. Like I knew cocaine from like dare and drug education and whatnot, but it was just like, this is a thing that's illegal and bad and you don't do. So I didn't like, it didn't. Are you saying you did cocaine when you were 12? No, it didn't click with me. Like how stupid that ending scene was where he has the fucking mountain <laughs> of cocaine. All the cocaine. Until a quote, yeah, close friend of mine tried coke and, I'm, and they were just like, oh, 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 that makes more sense now. Just how fucking stupid that is. You would never. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just like that. That ending scene is made for the stupidest fucking people in the world. Just that he would need that much cocaine. That he would just have it out. Just like, yeah, I'm going to have. <laughs> The uh, amount of cocaine that could pay for several houses on my <laughs> desk. Just like Scrooge McDuck with this <laughs> cocaine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yes, there's no cocaine in this one. No. Instead, we've got booze. But yeah, this was my pick. Yes. Uh, this was, you know, Max, if somebody had told me uh, this was our first Howard Hawks movie, I think I would have called them a liar and slapped them in the face. Because uh, I would have I would have said, you, who's Howard Hawks? Because I can't remember. <laughs> you should definitely get yourself familiar with Howard Hawks. He's one of my favorite directors. He's awesome. He's awesome. Uh, he uh, The movie that I expected us to do of his first was The Thing from Another World. 
which of course was yeah but i'd rather watch the thing i think we all would <laughs> so i'm just saying for contrast you yeah know, maybe that would have been a good one i love you know movies with an intellectual carrot that's my thing i really that might be the only one so um, i treasure that one a lot uh but i don't i, I don't know I, I'm, I'm a fan of emma stone so i don't think that ah uh, joke yes <laughs> joke who else is an intellectual carrot well you think of that and i'll do my intro and then i want to hear back from you and Five minutes. Um, but yeah, so the reason I chose this movie today is uh, I really don't know. Uh, <laughs> gangster movies are a genre we have not done yet. And that's my thinking so far for a lot of these picks. Is like, oh, we haven't done a gangster movie yet. Let's do it. We haven't done a Howard Hawks movie yet. Let's do it. And uh, yeah, I just think I'm this is a really that, solid movie too. I'm glad that you put that much advanced thought into it. Because like my picks for movies are just like, I thought about this or I saw something with this or I'm in the mood for this genre right now. So yeah. I'm glad that you're just like, we need to take our podcast in this new direction. I was like, what about this movie? I'm all about <laughs> contrast yeah. is what I'm saying. And once you dive into a genre for the first time, I think it's cool because then you can sort of, it lets you sort of like freestyle a little bit more. Not that we have fans that continuously listen to the show really, but like, sure we do shout out to you guys. I know who you are. All right. Thank you for interrupting me to address literally no one. <laughs> but anyway, once you do a genre for the first time, I think on this show, it allows you to have a frame of reference for when you jump into it again. So that's why I feel like contrast is fun because you can just introduce new ideas, new concepts, new genres, and then you can go back to it. And now you're like weaving a tapestry. It's cool. Look uh, out next week when we try our first romantic comedy. Have we, uh, we'll get to that eventually. I've been thinking about it, but, um, but yeah, so why this one in particular? Well, just because I'm a big fan of Howard Hawks and I'm more familiar that, with this movie than, uh, some of the other sort of gangster movies from like that classic pre-code period. And, uh, yeah, I just think it's a really good movie with solid performances. Um, it's formally interesting and I think it is, I think it's something that feels very contemporary like aesthetically, I think it feels very fresh to watch this movie. It's now getting close to what 90 years old, uh, so it's definitely getting up there. But I think it's just a really oh, solid God. movie. I was about to correct your math, and I'm just like, oh no, he's right. Yeah, <laughs> it's going, time is moving forward. Yeah, so you know, I think it's it's just really good, and uh, I have a hard time comparing it in my mind to the Brian De Palma one because I haven't seen that one in so long. Uh, yeah, we're going to get that out of the way so we don't do it the entire film. But yeah, most people, when you say the name of Scarface, are more familiar with the Brian De Palma, Al Pacino star. It's one of those one. posters you see on college dorms all the time for yeah, some reason. Right up there with Reservoir Dogs. And, I, and The Endless Summer. And even I, though nobody's seen these movies. I used to think, like my recollection of Scarface was, this is going to be a weird analogy, but bear with me. I have a relationship with the band Black Flag, where I don't dislike Black Flag. But just from my personal experience, if you're the kind of person who really likes Black Flag, like you have a Black Flag tattoo, I don't like you. Um, you're you're saying that they're starting an uphill battle. Sort yeah, of. Um, I'd agree. There's a ton of movies like that. This Scarface from '83. That's one of them. For and sure. then I rewatched Scarface. I forget in what context. I think somebody I knew was just like, "Oh, well, I'm gonna put this on." I'm just like, "Okay, if you insist, can't be." as bad as I remember. Cause I remember just being like, Oh, well, it's like a classic gangster film. And I remember rewatching it. Like this movie's dumb. It's like, it's stupid. It's long. It's Al Pacino's acting. Yeah. It's over the top and fun and charismatic at parts, but like, yeah, it overshadows what's supposed to be a tragic fall. And the reason that people like it so much is rather than trying to be just like, Oh, isn't it sad that this character lost so much chasing material wealth? People are just like, yeah, I want to be fucking Scarface. And it's like the, the, the entire. He says, fuck a lot. He says, fuck a lot. And it's fuck, like, you don't fuck me. Okay. And, and then he does his silly. <laughs> I, I know missing the point and identifying with the character you're supposed to be horrified is like really <laughs> common in a lot of people like Fight Club and View for Vendetta yes. and stuff like that. But or the Big Lebowski, the Big Lebowski, the modern TV shows, fucking Rick from Rick and Morty. Those people sure. are the worst. Um, but I think that movie, it's not entirely at fault of people because like the movie also kind of the Al Pacino one. Oh, yeah. Wants you to like the it character. It definitely loses sight, if I remember, because I, yeah. I haven't seen in a long time 
of like the same thing this one is trying. This one's far more objective, I think, yeah. um, if you're going to compare them. And also that one, like you're saying, just has like, it's a, like a Reagan thing. It's like, it feels like, oh, we're just going over the top with this shit. Uh, and it feels very like 80s and Reagan. And uh, this one is a little bit more restrained too. There's a lot of elegance to this one. Do you think that comparison is part of why you enjoy this one a lot? Yeah, uh, I upon rewatching this, because I had never seen this before. I had heard of it, but I had never watched it before. And I, I was only really familiar with uh, a little bit of gangster movies before this. Like, I had seen a Little Caesar at some point. So during, you were a little familiar school. with Little Caesar. Yeah. Um, and we, we will be doing the our Little Caesar stereotypical gangster impressions throughout the commentary. So Edgar G. Robinson. Brace for that. Or Edward. Sorry. <laughs> I was, I was gonna roast you if you didn't change that. J. Edgar Robinson. But yeah, watching this because I was expecting it to just be like a very procedural, very just like look how bad this man is. He's yeah, he's a meanie and manner demoralizing. The the good yeah. the good cops are gonna show him the error of his ways and he might have to die, but he'll just be like, Oh, I see where it all went wrong now, Jimmy. But um, <laughs> he's talking to Jimmy Stewart. I don't know, but something like that. And to my shock, watching this movie, I was laughing. Like the yeah. the slapstick moments, the awkward moments. Like they still land over eighty years later. Like it, it like the the violence. Like of course, is nothing to be compared to the shit we see today. But like for the time, is remarkable. Especially it's like. I knew you're going to hate me for thinking this, but this is like the Mortal Kombat of, of old films where like this is the thing that forced the Hays Code to like be fully applied to one most, of the things. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was like a major tipping factor of just like, oh, OK, now we need to universally hold this for movies in order for them to get into theaters, even though they tried to cut stuff out. And there were two ver different versions of the movie in the end because they wanted to try to yeah please the Hays Code and yeah, whatever. But so much of this movie landed for me. I was genuinely surprised. And I think it is because it's a better character examination. It's a better just like this guy is chasing money and power, but to what end, why it doesn't really care about that. And I enjoy that where it's just like, yeah, he doesn't, it doesn't matter why he is, but like look at everything he's willing to sacrifice to get there. And for what yeah. it's hollow. It's it sort of has a little bit of a distance from him. Yeah. Instead of trying to 100% gain access to his mind, but it gives you evidence of his mind's inner workings. And then finally at the end that, you know, the realization that he has about everything that's going on around him. So he sort of has, he's somebody who's never really able to fully articulate the way they feel at any given point in the movie. But yeah, I think uh, everything you've said is is correct. So are you ready to jump into this movie? Yeah, see? Oh, God. It's Universal, Max. Yes. It's universally considered to be a great movie. Is is there anybody that doesn't like this movie? No. I don't think there really is. A lot of people really enjoy this. I think it's a it's a good movie to show like in in maybe like a more like 101 film 101 setting because it has again like you're saying that weird effect where it's like this movie cuts through 80 years yeah. in between when you're watching it now and when it was released and, and it's just great. It's there's just, literally one moment which I won't give away now but I'll let you know when it happens that I like I was literally just like dying in my chair <laughs> laughing because it like it feels like it could be a joke in a movie now there's a lot of comedy yeah. stuff that happens in this and we'll be bringing that up uh in reference to some academic material on this movie there's quite a bit uh I wasn't able to read all of it but a lot of it is very interesting and uh yeah I think um oh my god look Lovo is played by Osgood Perkins welcome back to the podcast Osgood Perkins he was on our Legally Blonde episode. Oh, okay. Yes. Director of The Black Coat's Daughter. Of course. It's very interesting how his career started before his father's, Anthony Perkins. He's been around for a while. <laughs> you need to stop this. <laughs> so the real first thing to point out. Because when you movie, go off on like a certain actor, like most of the time, I'm just like, yeah, sure, whatever. You, you talk about them. So no. you did not get that joke. No, I didn't. So that joke was literally just for myself. 
and I didn't even laugh. And Neil Gaiman. Well, welcome to the show. Um, oh, here we have this amazing, this amazing uh, title card, which I love how it's it's attempting to sort of um, avoid censorship, which they anticipated. Uh, no, um, actually, I found out something researching this. This was added afterwards. Yes. This was not them trying to avoid censorship. This was them complying with Hayes after they threw such a fit. Well, this is technically pre-code. Yeah, I know it is, but but like, they came down so fucking hard on this movie for how violent and atrocious it was. My point I was just making was that I think it's amusing that their means of doing that is by throwing it back in the audience's face and blaming you for this. Yeah. This is about you. What are you going to fucking do about it? But anyway... Here we have this amazing opening image of the street lamp fading. We see this little after party uh, cleanup situation going on here. And Max, this is going to bring up a feature of this movie that I think is something that is inherent in a lot of gangster movies of this type. Um, but this one seems to focus on a lot. And it's something I'm going to bring up continually. And that's the idea of excess. Right. And remember, this is a movie that takes place contemporaneously in 1932, sort of. Right. Um, or more specifically, maybe the late 20s, because that's when the uh, real massacre happened uh, that they do with the St. Valentine's yeah. Day massacre. Um, but what's happening here, right? We have, what is a party visually, except for the most excessive environment imaginable, right? It's pure excess, right? And now we have these gangsters that we're seeing and they're talking about things. Um, but I think the interesting part of this is about how gangster movies like this, we've brought up the title card already they kind of play like morality tales in a lot of ways like you said you were surprised that this one wasn't super moralizing so it's very uh sort of i don't know adventurous in how it actually examines its material um and it doesn't try to like constrain it and chastise the audience really the same way but i think excess is an important part of how the mor moral logic operates in this universe and sort of maybe how audiences at the time and still today might relate to certain characters at different moments. Uh, and I think excess is something you can really point to in this movie. And again, it, it appears here with this character who's about to be killed. Yeah. Excess, when a character becomes excessive, it becomes sort of different. It becomes dangerous. It becomes uh, sort of something that is going to put other people at risk. The other interesting thing about this opening is like the horror movie aesthetic. Did you pick up on that watching this? Uh, to a degree. It makes great use of shadows. Shadow obviously. on the wall. Yeah. yeah. But just the idea of like the image of the street lamp going out, everybody's leaving him alone and he's going to become a victim. And we get a little bit of like a depth cue when he enters from the side of the frame deep. You see the shadow as he opens the door from that hallway, right? Yeah. And uh, I think that's interesting because it also... Oh, this is the thing that... Um, oh, I, I noticed because I was researching. I did I did some cursory research of the gangster genre. As you do. Um, preparing for this. And the use of X's when somebody dies... It's, con it's constant. It's constant yeah. in this movie. Um, it's also something that Scorsese ripped off for... Yeah, fucking, what is it, Goodfellas? Or not... And then also it was in the departed very any number of things yeah, like, you could have done. Yeah. But uh, like, it's, it's, it is not even in just scenes where people die. It is yeah. like it, the X thing is ubiquitous in this and it's rarely obtrusive is the thing. But I mean, it begins even in like the title card, right? With the, the credits, you see the giant X in the background. Yeah. So it's very interesting how that works. It's definitely, um, something, an, an image that has like a weird violent, connotation to it you know like xing out of something also uh interesting thing here this is something we'll just skip over pretty quickly but again we're here in the newspaper room and i think it's probably interesting to look at howard hawks's career and how he kind of helped shape the aesthetic of newspaper rooms and how those movies look nowadays but like between this what do we get we get this long sort of shot that tracks with this guy but it also passes through a wall you know, it's very interesting. He passes through a wall. We see him. We see, do we see the ceiling? Maybe we do. Um, but point is, I feel like between this movie and especially stuff like His Girl Friday, that really helps build that aesthetic. And I think that's a fun little note to go back and pick up when discussing this movie as well. Also, because these movies, like we said, relate to newspapers. 
Uh, these are very much like headline ripping movies. All of these like gangster movies in this 30s period. That's why probably you look at these several 30s gangster movies as forming a part of like a a cycle. Even though, as you said, there were plenty of gangster movies beforehand. Yeah, you like, know. I think I think I found like the first movie that could be called a gangster movie would be like Musketeers of Pig Alley is usually yeah. the one people will talk about. There's probably some before that too. There's some that like feature gangsters. I think it was like in 1906 or something. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Musketeers of Pig Alley, did not that you like use actual gangsters and prostitutes as extras in the movie? They're, oh, I I don't even know. I, I don't know much about that movie. I believe that was the like its big claim to fame is they they just went and shot in location on Chicago and they were just like, Hey, you want to be in the movie? And they're like, Ooh, I mean, there's a lot of like sure. neat sequences from that movie. Yeah. Um directed by W D or D. W. Griffith. Um, so definitely gonna be a movie of historical note and interesting. Uh but here we have our introduction to Paul Muni as Scarface. And again, mm. another X on his face. Which kind of, he's marked for death from the beginning. But, um. He is marked for death from the beginning. I think that's an important part to bring up in this. And uh, I think that's probably something you're picking up on is the same thing a lot of critics pick up on when they discuss gangster movies in relation to like a tradition of the tragic mode of storytelling. Because that's very much a feature of this type of movie, right? The gangster will have a rise, then a fall. Yeah. That seems ubiquitous in these movies. And again, I think it relates. I would love, like, in one of these movies, like, when the guy tries to do a cool thing like that, like, I'm going to light my cigarette on your It just doesn't work. Like, the match breaks in half. He's like, oh, fuck. (laughs) This is a Mel Brooks gag. (laughs) He just uses an entire box of matches. I'll get it eventually. (laughs) If you'll just stand still, officer, excuse me trying to uh, light my cigarette here. But yes, so uh, again, I think the idea of excess is also something that relates to the tragic element of this movie and, uh, you know, him being marked for death, right? Yeah, and this is like right after the Great Depression hit. During the Great Depression. Yeah, I guess, yeah. yeah. Um, So like you have... If we're, if we're trying to get in the mindset of like the audiences that loved this movie, because this movie did do well. I think it was like yeah the 10th highest grossing movie of the year from what I found. Um, but you have people who are super, super poor for the most part. You have the elites that have promised that if you work hard in America, you'll mm-hmm. be successful. That's been proven false. They've run off to their ivory towers with all their money and you're fucking stuck in the mud. And it's not just the Great Depression. It is like, the. it's almost impossible for me personally to put myself in that mindset where yeah. it's like, you. it's not just the Great Depression. It is the contrast of it coming immediately after the roaring 20s. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, it's and not then, a coincidence. It's like... No, it's related. Exactly. And I think you know, visually it's like, it is like that idea of like, you have the party, right? And then after the party, there's the hangover, the repressed bad part is going to come get you and they're related to one another, you know? So, uh, here's another interesting moment that will continue our conversation about excess and tragic stuff is, is, is this passes, but this is definitely worth commenting on the way this police chief treats them, because I think that is a key part of what sets this up as a tragic mode and actually helps establish him as a sympathetic character, even though right now, as we're watching this moment, we know that he's a killer. We know it. Yeah. Yeah? Um, We know that he's going to tell this guy off and that he definitely killed Costello, right? But what this police chief is going to do and what his, like, number two guy has already done is they are overstepping the boundaries of the law and in doing so, treat him in an inhuman way. And even more specifically, what's going to happen is he's going to dress him down basically as like a like an off-the-record, unofficial statement. He's going to get real with Tony here, right? And what, what happens when this police chief gets real with him is actually he gets super racist. Yeah. And he says stuff like, oh, I've, I've, you know, tangled with your kind before. You know, I know your breed. He literally says the word breed. You know, and he talks about how like, oh, you think you can come over here and just be successful just by pointing a gun around it and, I, and I'm going to stomp all over you and I'm going to fuck your mother and and, and do all sorts of <laughs> I other missed stuff. that line. I must have blinked. Yeah. 
Well, but, it's it, it's an implication. It's subtext. Yeah, but so, but getting back to my thing of just like, it is just like you can come over here. You get a gun, as long as like you're you're quick witted and you kill the right. There it people. is. Look, yeah, yeah, you think you're gonna get there with a gun, and he's basically. Here's the interesting thing, though. If you remove that line about a gun, it just becomes a racist, like, you know, diatribe or whatever, right? Mixing with your breed. Oh, my God. Who the fuck says that? A racist person (laughs) says that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think also race is is something that's going to play an important part in gangster movies and sort of mob movies and how those things work together over the course of the 20th century. I think it's definitely an element that's present here as well. And uh, I think part of the thing that's important about that is, again, what is it? It's the law being excessive and in doing so, overstepping their boundaries and refusing to treat him as a human being. Even though we know he's guilty, we somehow walk away from the scene feeling a certain sense of like sympathy with him because of the way he's so cool and calm and collected, but also because... The police chief is a fucking asshole, and he's racist. <laughs> Not that people would have responded to racism the same way necessarily at the time, but I think it also goes goes to sort of characterizing Tony as a type of blue collar character at this moment, you know, who is who killed a big gangster. But why do we care? Because he's an excessive asshole. You know what I mean? Why do we care if a gangster dies? Yeah, we just saw him. He's like he's just like. It's yeah. like five o'clock in the morning and like, it's just him and his two associates. And he's like, we're going to yeah. have a vinegar party and it's going to be better. And they're going to be like, wow, you're great. And then, yeah. And it's like, do you think audiences in, in 1932 would have been like, wow, I can really relate to this guy <laughs> throwing his massive parties one week after the other and having multiple cars and shit. Or do you think they relate to maybe we should kill that guy? <laughs> yeah. I or, think there might've been a slight air of eat the rich. <laughs> Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important part of looking at how this movie works, too, and why we have sympathy for him, because he's really, he has a certain level of, like, monstrous criminal behavior. Maybe criminal isn't the right word, because that also is something at work here, but he has violent behavior inherent in almost everything he does, and uh, he dehumanizes a lot of people around him constantly. But we have that sympathy for him because he, he is introduced in response to things we already don't like. Right. He's introduced in response to the rich criminal gangster. Yeah. And then at this point in the movie, he might as well have been, just been doing the police a favor by fucking killing that guy. You know, like what does he we haven't seen him gain anything from that yet, really. Yeah. He's still a blue collar character at this point in time. And he's charming, sort yeah. of. Well, he's trying to be. Yeah. I think it's interesting because part of that charm is like his naivety, you know, like he, he, he's a character who is not like cultured like this guy, you know what I mean? He's way more blue collar than this guy. This guy walks around in a fucking robe all the time. Right. (laughs) And, uh, something else that's interesting, that's a pattern that's going to play out during this movie that we've already seen is how that blue collar nature is kind of going to express itself in the way Tony interacts with different objects and things that he will later come to acquire with his wealth. And uh, in this scene, he, he, the two objects he really pays attention to are one, this robe, and then two, Poppy, right? Now, Poppy's a little bit more specific because there's a lot to discuss in terms of how he relates to women in this movie and tries to possess them. But as far as the robe is concerned, it's interesting because he comments on it and expresses a desire for it. And later we will see him sort of try to satisfy that desire by, you know, continuously like getting fancier and fancier with his outfits. You know what I mean? Um, And I think the thing to pay attention to and track throughout this movie is how Tony's sense of aesthetics kind of wavers and changes from one scene to the next. And it's all in relation to how he discusses or like looks at different objects that he'd like to possess. And I think, again, that relates to like the depression era audience because it's like, you know, you're fantasizing, you're salivating over these objects, right? But when does it become excessive and make you distance you from the character? Well, it becomes excessive when they start to have a sense of aesthetics, when it's not the thing in and of itself, it's, oh, I don't like green. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
And there's a number of ways that plays out, and it's kind of interesting. Well, that's like in the the remake of Scarface, if you can even call it a remake. I mean, it's a similar story, I guess. About, yeah. Um, where at the end of the movie, people are just like, oh, well, he had it all. And the movie kind of indulges in that, where it's just like, look at this amazing mansion, look at all the cocaine, look at the women. It fetishizes the same things that he Yeah, but up, the point yeah. is, like, at that point, like, he's alone. He has nobody left, and he's trying to... And the fact that he, like holds off a bunch of police with with his little friend. Yes, with his little friend. Yeah. Over and over. It was just like it misses the point of just like you've achieved all of this like superficial material wealth. I think John Mulaney described it the best in a bit where he's just like he's in a mansion that looks like if the Golden Girls won the lottery. Like <laughs> it's the most like tacky, expensive, stupid looking thing. Well, it's good you bring that up now because this is a, probably a good moment to mention it. He's going to, in this scene when he's driving in the car with, um, oh God, what's this other character's name? His number two, his best friend that he's going to wind up killing later. Yeah. He's going to say something that is very much like a twisted articulation of like an idea of the American dream where he's like, okay, I'm going to tell you the most important thing. He's like, do it first, do it yourself, and keep doing it. There's three things he says, and it's very disturbing in this context. And I guess one of the things we haven't really mentioned, because I guess we were just taking it for granted in our conversation about this movie so far, is how gangster movies inherently are movies, a genre that is going to discuss and interrogate the idea of the American dream, right? And it's very interesting because the gangster character is a character who um, they, I, I sort of compare like the gangster genre to Westerns in this way, where it's like, it's a specifically American form of myth making, you know, yeah. both about the country and oneself, the individual. Oh God, it's Anne Vor, Vor- uh, I can't pronounce her last name. I think it's Vorshik, Anne Vorshik. And she's fucking awesome in this movie. Oh no, she's, uh, she's a highlight for me. I think she was not originally supposed to be cast and she was only talked into it by uh, the woman who plays Poppy. Interestingly enough. But either way, I think this was her first role or one of her first roles. She's awesome in this movie. That's also another thing I found is in apparent, apparently the original cut of this movie, it was like purely just like, familial bonds like brother and sister yeah. against the world type of thing and in an attempt to make him a less sympathetic character that audiences would apparently want to emulate and be like they added the weird incestual it, undertones to it it is weird how like the the incest is something they they added to perhaps more please censorship yeah um, but it is an important part of this movie. And also that get, goes back to the casting of Anne Forshack and why it's important that she's so fucking great in this role because she's going to disappear throughout the movie a little bit. You know, it's important that she really catches your attention and she's able to uh, be sort of an emotional epicenter at different points in the movie because that weird incestuous element is again, another expression of what the like excess of Tony's character. Everything about him is excess. That's what the gangster is, right? And uh, to put it in more like thoroughly articulated terms, the thing I was thinking of in looking at this movie and the way it sets up a dialectic in its plot and everything is relating it to a sort of Hegelian ideal idea of tragedy, which we've, we've actually referenced like Hegel's ideas of how stories work. This is how like people discuss, you know, Hollywood in terms of dialectical progression of stories that comes from Hegel. Right. And, uh, it's something that's definitely at play very much in tragedy because, and this is a reduction of his theories, by the way, they're pretty sophisticated. So don't quote me exactly. Okay. But, but Hegel's ideas of tragedy is like, okay, you start with two characters who have a virtue, right? Two different characters who have their own girl, own girl, they have their own goals and their own virtues, right? And it becomes tragic when these virtues, they commit to them too much to the point where their virtue becomes excessive and it becomes exclusionary of other things, right? So they have to go into conflict conflict with one another because they have become excessive, right? And that's the nature of this movie. And what is excessive sexual desire? It is, it's sort of an incestuous sexual desire, you know? Yeah excessive possessiveness, you know, 
Oh, by the way, there was another instance of uh, of an ex when she tosses him the coin. Right, we yeah. see her through the uh, the bars on her windows or whatever it is. And also, I think this is this is a slight trope: the coin tossing gangster type yes. thing. This yeah. is the first instance of that. I actually had to look that up, but well, I think it's also something that appears throughout a number of Howard Hawks Howard Hawks's movies. Um, and, uh, it's definitely something that's interesting in the fabric of this movie, because like we were talking about, these movies discuss the idea of the American dream. And then by extension, the idea of like how that interacts with the realities of capitalism, you know, and think about that scene. That's interesting, right? She tosses him the coin. What does he do? He keeps her coin and substitute it for another one. But that's very interesting in the way that they interact with one another, like sort of revolving around the idea of money, which is very similar to the way that Tony interacts with Poppy all the time, right? Their interaction also revolves around money, but it's a very different conclusion, you know? She makes herself very much an object that Tony can purchase, you know what I mean? Whereas with that, it's a little bit more sophisticated. There's back and forth. And of course, the the weird incestuous part of that scene where we meet Anne Vorschach that we didn't really discuss is how when Tony catches her making out with some dude, he then gives her money the same way he would do with Poppy. It's very, it's the same. It's the exact same. And the mother in her admonishment of of Anne Vorschach's character is kind, not explicitly says it, but like she warns her in a way that's kind of creepy, you know? You're just another girl. (laughs) Yes, it's like, oh, what? Excuse me. Well, it's almost, it's kind of like, not an Oedipus complex almost, but like, it's like why we see uh, mothers as hor- in horror a yes. lot, where it's like, <laughs> it's almost like it's horrifying to the male brain because it's a woman that you can't, uh, like, have possess. sex with yes. yeah, or possess. Well, okay, and you're saying it's not, an Oedipus complex, but if you wanted to do a psychoanalytic reading of this movie, which you totally could given that family dynamic, they, people would definitely say that he is responding to an Oedipal drive, right? Cause think about it. Is there a dad in that family? No, there is not. not. Uh, he is the man that we see in that house. And part of the idea of Oedipal progression is that you have a male character who's going to displace like agency and like their own arc in their own mind onto possession of a woman. (laughs) You know what I mean? So they're going to wrap up their own growth onto their ability to possess a woman. And when they do that, they, they have agency, you know, but when that's, when that's risked, when that possession is risked, when they feel like they don't have ownership, then they go crazy. Yeah. So that's sort of the same thing that's going on. Um, only in this time, you know, it is not his mother explicitly, although he seems in charge of just the entire house. It is his sister. So I would say it is kind of there still. And then we have this character, the phone guy. And it is funny. It reminds me a lot of like Marx Brothers yeah. bits <laughs> Some for some reason, the way it's... Uh, and. and I don't know if we've mentioned it already, but there's another really good essay from a critic we've mentioned several times in his book on Howard Hawks, uh, Robin Wood, where he discusses this movie. And he actually, he discusses this in reference to Howard Hawks' comedies. And I think that's an interesting take because it's like, when you think about it, it's like, yeah, there's a lot of like bordering on slapstick moments in this. I mean, the, one of the most, I think the most iconic scene of this movie, the only scene I had seen before this Later on, the restaurant uh, shooting scene. Oh, yeah. That's like, I couldn't believe like they kept going with the slapstick it, bit. It, it is bordering on cartoony in yeah. some ways. Yeah. Especially with him in the phone. I can't hear what? What? It's one of those weird things where it's like, okay, this is not really funny. But then they keep yeah. <laughs> bringing it back. Because I thought like after like the first time, I'm like, okay, that's funny. Second time, I'm just like, oh, this character is going to die. Third time, I'm just like, wait, what? <laughs> it just keeps going yeah. and going. I'm just like, oh, my God. Let's jump in and talk about this shot, the wasting beer. Yeah. So we've already seen 
uh, Tony is now becoming sort of like an enforcer for Lobo, right? And they break into the social club and they're like, this is the way it's going to be, guys. And they explicitly say, you know what? We're going to fucking run this as a business. Yeah. So again, crossing boundaries. This is about capitalism, right? That's what these movies are about. The American dream. How do you achieve success? And uh, I think that's interesting because, again, if you're going to chart Tony and his character direction in this movie as something that begins with less excess. It seems like he's killing in response to other things around him. It seems like he is born in an unfair world and his targets that he goes after in that opening scene is just some rich asshole gangster, right? It becomes a little bit different as the movie progresses. Uh, he, he starts to kill in response to his own desire. Well, once he, which is what excessive because it's not necessary. Well, yeah, because he starts acting on his own desires rather than the desires of, okay, boss. Yeah, he's no longer blue collar. He's becoming a kind of a mercenary in a lot of ways. And I think it's interesting that you get those shots of things like the wasted beer. Because can you imagine being a Depression era audience member just having like, just I like figuring out how you're going to survive day to day, right? And then you see this character who in the beginning seems like they're doing this just out of survival, yeah. right? He's definitely been in like some sort of physical altercation, right? Um, and he's being pushed around by the police. He seems like somebody who you can sympathize with. But then he ends up going into this business thing. And was it the level of excess continually grows throughout the movie? And what is, I think, strikes me about the image of that beer being wasted specifically is how excessive that is to an audience, yeah. you know, because it's like, it's not enough for them to have beer. They have to shoot holes in the kegs and say, no, 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 you have to buy our beer. <laughs> Is there anything wrong with the beer you have? No, but it's not ours. You know what I mean? Mm. So You'll get a delivery tomorrow. Yes. So it's qu- sort of like, again, this... Also... There, another X. Yes. Yeah. This was shocking at the time because like gangster movies, like I mentioned before, Underworld had like... A sort oh, of the Josef von Sternberg. Yeah, maybe. but you had yep. like an honor among thieves type thing. Oh, this is a great image too. Yeah. This is almost like Soviet symbolic <laughs> moment right here. It's just so great, the aesthetics of this movie. It is, but like there's no honor in just like yeah. bringing a gun under flowers to kill a guy in a, in a hospital bed. Like it just does away with all pretext and it's like, no, they're just terrible. Well, that's, it's interesting you mentioned that too because if we're going to talk about how this movie relates to like, the American dream and the, like the upward progress idea of capitalism that it sells you. Right. I mean, this is a good moment of it too, right? He's got his, his suits on, you know, and, uh, he's, he's trying to be charming, but he's naive and silly and has poor taste. And she finds that kind of funny. Um, well also he's younger and more attractive than her. her Sure. Sugar daddy. And I'm just saying that I think even though we've now seen him get excessive with this outfit again, a way of demonstrating excess, he is, he retains sympathy because he still has this charm of like this naive, like goofball to her, you know? And we can kind of see that too. Although we've also seen the dark underside about how he treats his own family. Um, so it's going to get progressively more dramatic in both directions. <laughs> But um, oh, what was that? Oh, I was going to mention, there's another really, really fantastic essay that I'm going to post in the uh, show notes. It's only like several pages long. It's written by this guy named Robert Warshaw, I think. Um, but it's about gangster movies, and it's one of the, like the first major essays about the genre. And uh, he definitely confronts how this movie is something that, not this movie specifically, but gangster movies definitely deal with a discussion of capitalism. And when you're discussing that idea of like no honor among thieves, I think it's interesting to sort of compare that to like, imagine this movie just being about businessmen, right? Essentially it's very similar plot wise, right? What are they doing? They're competing for markets, you know, they are, uh, they're trying to, uh, force to find customers, you know, they're trying to grow, expand their enterprise. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like, it's interesting when you have that because you realize like, even though these are characters that live outside the law, they're essentially doing things that are almost like identical to the same types of behaviors that, you know, businessmen ostensibly within the law would not be doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. But we see here him for the first time having thoughts and dreaming bigger than his assigned role and, 
it is like it is conflicting. Gangster movies are always conflicting where it's just like, oh, this guy sees the big picture. He sees that you can take it all and then like, right. but what are you gonna have to do to get there? But this is again part of when you have a dialectical progression in movies like this, and when in these movies where they seem to incorporate an idea or at least an echo of like a Hegelian approach to tragedy where you have different sort of like social substances coming into conflict with one another. Like it's the weird contradiction you find when these things are clash with one another. It's like, Oh, okay. So Tony is a criminal who operates outside the law, but what, why does he do that to do the same things that he would do if he was inside the law? (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, okay, a criminal is defined by what they're, there are behaviors that violate the rules of of a society, right? And this is something he discusses in that paper, Warshaw. And uh, at the same time, the gangster movie is about characters who violate those societal rules, but do so in order to embody the image of success created by that society. You know, it's not for their own ends. It's just to do, to do what society tells them to do in the first place. So it's this weird contradiction, right? And that's why it's inherently always about capitalism because these gangster characters never exist outside of capitalism, even though they exist outside of the law. There's a difference. Well, yeah, like, <sighs> God. Oh, here Sometimes they f- become the law. You look at after the Soviet Union fell, the country was run by the mob for <laughs> yeah, a decade. I mean, even in gangster movies, like, yeah. I mean, it's not like Godfather Part 3 is good, but what is the whole thing with the progression from one to two, it's like they're getting bigger and more corporate and more like legit to the point where they become an institution. Yeah. You know? And, uh, that is, that's the progression that they go upon. Right. Um, and it's weird because these movies are like very sensationalistic kind of, and they, they work very well as popular narratives, but just inherent in that gangster idea in that contradiction, right, of the one who breaks societal rules in order to embody society's vision of success, you have, you have like this very like potent area where you can make points about the world people are living in, you know? I don't know. I can't write. (laughs) But I mean, it's also the same thing that you mine for comedy in moments like this, right? Where it's like, why does he really need a secretary? Because he wants to emulate being a big businessman yeah. guy. You know, that's the same reason why he has the funky clothes, the over the top clothes. That's why he has the suits. And that's why, you know, like in terms of like Tony's sense of aesthetics, does he ever really develop his own voice or preference for anything? No. In terms of the objects that he relates to and things he wants in his life, he never really like has his own discerning interiority. It's always him internalizing something that he thinks everybody should want. And then he goes after it as aggressively as possible. And that's what happens all the time. Even in moments like this, where it's just silly and he doesn't need a secretary. (laughs) And coin flipping gangster in at last. And again, I think we wind up with more sympathy for that character by the end compared to Tony because he's always sort of quiet, you know, and again, he's, he's less of an image of excess, you know? <laughs> oh, God, though. Like, it is almost like a Three Stooges cast almost. Yes, yeah. But again, I think that's, that's something that's interesting and something Hawks talks about in his essay is like, you know, the comedy is important to keeping audience sympathy. But here's my question, though, and something that I, I didn't find as many essays about just because I ran out of time preparing this week. But the idea of like, how does like the idea of race work in this movie? We know it is introduced sort of uh, whether they meant to or not. They definitely introduce it in that scene where the police chief is screaming at him. Uh, That is totally loaded language that the police chief is using. But one thing I was wondering is, uh, you know, how the idea of race and otherness relates to the comedy in this, because they are kind of three stooges. But again, it is like it's a it's like a it's like a farcical thing, right, where he's like he's trying to be a normal secretary. But no, I can't read. 
or I can't write, or I don't know what to do. I'm too much of an idiot, yeah. you know, and mining that for comedy. And the same thing goes for like Tony's naivete yeah. about everything is like part of it is a blue collar Well, him part. just being like, it's kind of gaudy, isn't it? Yes, isn't it? that's yeah. a great moment. Glad He's you like, like it. Yeah. And it is kind of endearing the way uh, Paul Muni plays it, right? And you're kind of like, you could understand if you were this shallow, awful woman who yeah. <laughs> just her whole life, she's just like, I just want to exchange hands as an object between murderers. Uh, and is this a real person? Who knows? <laughs> oh, Cook's Tours. There you go. Sponsored the movie. I don't know if that's true. This movie was financed by Howard Hughes, by the way. This is our first Howard Hughes movie. What do you think of that, Max? I think that a sentient carrot would have been more interesting. Oh, my God. Just imagine just a fucking carrot hanging out. Well, Howard Hughes actually turned into a sentient carrot at the end of his life. That's why he didn't go out anymore. That's disappointing to hear. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up, though. Oh, it is interesting because this movie was kind of an independent movie, actually. It was uh, distributed, right? But uh, they financed it on their own, as there. was... Terrifying carrot person. Oh, what the fuck are you <laughs> showing me? Max is showing me a disturbing image of a carrot in a... <laughs> Luchadore outfit or whatever. It's the it's just something that popped up on Twitter. It's the worst Yu Gi Oh card ever made. uh, World carrot Carrot weight champion. champion. Everybody go look that up. It's terrifying. (laughs) I'm so glad we got that in our Scarface commentary. So am I. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I don't know where to go from that. But uh, but he keeps bringing up. It's like, look, I got this jewelry at a bargain. Look, the spring is a bargain. Like. Yeah, it's all about how he's going to relate to different objects. Yeah, but he's also like, it's always about saving money despite him spending. And like, it's like contradiction. Like, uh, I don't know. But again, at some point, he's going to surpass even that boundary, right? And I think the ultimate moment is when he's at the theater later and he is now not even inclined to do the gangster activity because he'd rather sit and watch what? A play. You know, like that's the furthest detached. That's the most excessive he gets because there's nothing necessary about the play. It's literal unreality that you're watching unfold in front of you. And his like sense of aesthetics in that entire thing is like him trying to figure out who will the girl go with. Yeah. You know, uh, well, we have that later with the cigarette lighting scene where it becomes abundantly clear. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, it echoes his own life, but yeah. also it's like the aesthetic question for him in, in like his experience of that play has completely surpassed his interest in, in actually being a gang person. But here we have the police showing up again. Yeah. Now, Max, do they do this to you often? Um, they, they come, they come around, they pick you up. Yeah. They, they, they wear less fancy suits and they don't give me time to put on my best suit. Max is a public enemy. He's yes. a menace. He's a, he's a menace to society. Yeah. I I only think I have one thing on my record, actually. Um, trespassing without intent to harm. <laughs> Which was the excuse that uh, the cops pinned on me when they didn't like the fact that I said they couldn't search my car. So that was fun. You're trespassing on this road. I, I was in a public parking lot smoking a cigarette with some friends. And... <gasps> <gasps> oh, my God. It's Boris! It's Boris Karloff, Karloff, who is who, a who has never been picked up by a police for anything because he's he's so terrifying, sweet. <laughs> the police saw him. They're like, "Oh, I didn't realize that." <laughs> yes, a large corpse could drive a car. Okay. It is funny to see him in this role because this is post Frankenstein. Of yeah. course, when this movie was filmed, it was before Frankenstein was released. So yeah, it's but, kind of funny. He also like I remember like he puts on like an American accent for like the first line of dialogue. And then it like slips back into oh. Boris Karloff. I mean, he, uh, he is just, he is a distinctive voice, you know, yeah. like I, mean, I he wouldn't tried ever... for a little bit, but then he's just like, yeah, I am Boris Karloff. I cannot, I don't know what voice that was. That definitely yeah, wasn't a Boris Karloff. What fucking voice is that? That's not what Boris Karloff talks like.
And here we are. The most, possibly the most famous scene in the entirety of the film. Oh, this scene? Yeah, besides the end. At I least. wouldn't know what scene is the most famous than this. This movie is just so strong throughout, you know, that it's kind of hard for me to differentiate one scene from the next. It's so seamlessly put together, you know? It's like every scene leads to the next, and now we're going. It's like a motor. It's great. Uh, and I feel like a lot of Hawks movies feel that way. He's definitely somebody who's very good at making movies feel very, like, f- quick tempo, like fast, fast, fast. Um, probably most notably in his comedies, uh, you would pick that up because the dialogue is just, yeah, it's just like, he's just burning right through it. But even in this movie, it's still got that going on. And of course, uh, that is the first example with Boris Karloff, right? Where we see some results of Tony's excess. Again, another example of his excess he goes above his pay grade and makes a decision that his boss didn't want him to make because he wants to, why? Because he just wants to expand. He wants to keep going, right? And uh, he uh, goes and attacks the North Side people and O'Hara's boys, and right? No, he kills O'Hara. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, in, in the, in the uh, flower shop, right? Yes. So he's completely surpassed what they wanted him to do to the point where he is now putting everybody in danger. And this is the first time we're going to see actual consequences for that. And yeah, because up until now, you're just like, yeah, I agree with Tony. He's, he's getting off scot-free for all of this. But then we get violent yeah, drive-by yeah. thing punctuated with slapstick comedy. Yeah. Well, I, it's a very interesting scene because you get, you get the slapstick comedy, right? But also the way everything <laughs> is staged, it's very interesting because it's like, it's this weird moment of like, it's like a pre Susan Kane, not deep focus, but it's very much emphasizing depth in this image. You know, the idea of like the people shooting them from the outside and the bullets exploding in from outside, you know? So it's this very weird atmosphere that it creates and what it's cutting, <laughs> cutting between, you know? This weird slapstick and then like the cars driving by on the outside shooting everybody. And of course, his reaction where he's like a kid. Yeah. And I'm sure uh, people are sick of me talking about the idea of excess at, by this point, but no, because but it's the it's a constant theme of the movie. Yes, yeah, and again, some more interesting sort of multi-plane planes of depth in this moment. But um, his like childlike reaction, like it reinforces like the gangster is almost like a folk hero at this point. Not even, a, but like a folk yes, hero. yeah. It's just like oh, he wants more and more and more, and nothing can stop him until his preordained time to fall and be replaced by the next up and comer. Like, right. But it's, it's also because it's like, that is kind of a breach for us watching it. Now it feels like it's breaching from like an idea of naturalism in that scene because you have the slapstick joke about him on the phone, but also because of Tony's reaction, you know? And, uh, it's sort of like the slapstick nature of itself starts to become more noticeable in different moments as the movie progresses. And it's like the, the idea of slapstick in and of itself is excessive. You know, it's like the movie keeps growing and, and expanding in its excess and it's sort of a demonstration of how excessive these characters are uh, from one scene to the next. And of course the, the excess in this case becomes something that becomes repressive yeah. And comes at the expense of other people eventually. We don't get a lot of scenes that really moralize it to us. But one thing I noticed watching it for this week is how, you know, originally you get a lot of the scenes of initial violence from Tony. And I mean violence that he isn't outside the opening scene, right? Because in that sense, like we've discussed, it maybe feels a little bit more emotionally logical, Right. And for some reason, we, we as an audience doesn't necessarily hold that against him as much. But from the la- scenes of violence later in the movie where Tony is killing people yeah. and he is the one making the decision to do that, uh, you throughout the rest of the movie start to get more and more moments where it's, it's not a lot, but you get scenes where you the camera will hold on people a little bit and you'll see people now rush to the bodies or you'll hear a scream in the background where you didn't before. You know, beforehand, you just heard the bullets and then nothing. And you saw him throw the bomb and then nothing. Like, here's a good moment, right? He gets shot, but we hold on it as he's reading the paper and slowly falls. Yeah. And we hear these people yell, right? 
Um, and then another scene, we're going to hear somebody get shot and then we're going to hear a scream and then somebody's going to run over to them and, and check on them or whatever. Um, but again, it's interesting because it's a contrast to the other montage like this that we saw already, right? They're, they, they can be compared to one another. And in this one, you get more moments where the violence doesn't just end the moment they're dead. You actually have to deal with the consequences of there being a body a little bit. And it keeps going and going and going until eventually, you know, the consequences of the violence are like, oh, you just killed your best friend. Oh, you just got your sister killed. Yeah. You know? I mean, the sister is the final nail in the straw, but... The final nail in the straw. Yes. You know, my, my, my favorite Malifor. Um, yeah. <laughs> I still... Uh, no, I'm still a fan of... Yeah, we'll burn that bridge when we get to it, but... <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, all that beer. Yeah. Th- this, Wasting all the beer. If I have to say one thing about this movie that is a little eh yeah, for me, is there is just a lot of things of just like, look at them doing this now. Look at them doing this now. And I get we're establishing like how total and excessive he's going with it. And yeah. Having, oh, another X. Look. Yep. Consistent theme. But again, now we're getting people crowding around the bodies, you know? And uh, he, he can't just do everything. Like, ooh, it's car crash. Drawing attention to it now. Yeah. But it's interesting how like we get these scenes and it's like, Jesus, this is like nonstop action in this montage now, you know? And this is the 30s. Imagine how fucking violent this is for the 30s. We got to call fucking Batman. <laughs> oh, my God. What? He hasn't been written yet? Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, and of course, this this sequence of violence is going to culminate in the in the like historical reference point, which is the St. Valentine's day massacre, right? Yes. Where this, I mean, the entire sequence is sensationalistic, but this is just a recreation of something that literally when they were shooting this, I think happened the year prior. Yeah, no, it was a bunch of people it, just got murdered. It was fresh. In yeah. The mind. It, that, well, that's like, that was one of Al, yeah, Al Capone's big things, right? Yeah. And it's like how he seized control. Um, but I don't know. I, my memory of actual gangster history has faded and, not that interested in refurbishing it <laughs> at any time soon. Yeah. But it, you know, that is something that's definitely worth remembering in terms of how you watch this movie now is like, it is very much of its time and place. We've discussed about how like the idea of a depression era audience might change the way they relate to these characters, but also like, think about it this way. Like these movies are like almost like a fan fiction yeah, of things that are happening for real in the newspapers at this point in time. Like, I mean, it was not very glamorous, the life they were really living frequently, right? Uh, but people people made, like, folk heroes out of gangsters at this time because they were, you know, people who were seen as maybe punching upward at authority, you know? <laughs> now Boris Karloff is scared. And you don't want to scare Frankenstein. No, this is the first time that's ever happened. I know he's Frank. Ryan's, I always think of him, him in the role of the mummy. I don't know why, but like in the mummy, yeah, wasn't he in that? Or yeah, I, yeah. Why? I don't know. I d- just like that image from the mummy is more heavily ingrained in my mind. I guess the his face. Um, you should see doctor. Why? Because you need to get that checked out. <laughs> I think that's I don't not think normal. It's a, I don't think it's a better movie. I just think I'm just saying that I think that's not normal. I think I think you might have some major issue going on. You should do some blood work. That's all I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> but no. I think the interesting thing about Boris Karloff, if we're going to mention his career, is uh you know, I mean, think of him thinking of him in reference to the mummy is one thing, but it, people definitely think of him in reference only to Frankenstein too much. Yeah. He's a fantastic actor. I think part of the reason that I think uh, he he might be the most underrated actor of this period of time in Hollywood. He was he's awesome. He's fantastic actor. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just thinking of the Ed Wood scene. The Karloff is not fit to lick my shit. <laughs> oh, with Bella Lugosi. Yes. Yeah. You know, I do, I can't even remember if that was like I think that's mostly like a one sided. Thing. Well, I, go see I think it's because <laughs> Karloff like kind of continued on after the Universal stuff. And, like, well, look. not that Bella Lugosi was a bad actor. No, but, like, but 
I'm saying Lugosi like faded out after that. Like, yeah, I think it was more just because he was such like an iconic Dracula that like he could never escape the shadow of that to a degree. Like, well, neither could. I mean, Karloff could though because he's a better actor. Yeah, is the thing. But also, like, Lugosi was kind of delusional about himself. I'm not like an expert on his life and everything, but I have no doubt that he maybe. Uh, if he had been more realistic about not being able to play romantic leads yeah. the way he wanted to, then maybe he uh, would have been able to find more substantial roles in like bigger Hollywood movies for like the rest of the thirties. But instead he sort of, he had a little bit of an ego and then of course he had those money problems and the drug issues. Right. So that kind of forced his hand in a way that was unfortunate. So it was almost impossible for him to escape it because I don't know if he ever really even gave himself that opportunity. But that's more <sighs> speculation. I'm not an expert. What I do know for a fact, though, is that this man screaming in my face, looking right into the camera, was shot by another director after the yeah, fact. Yeah, this was a, like a huge scene that they added. Yeah. Just to be like, look how bad this is. He's murdering everybody. I'll look into the camera. Yeah. What are you going to do? You're the government. It's your government. What are you going to do? Stop showing sympathy to these people. I mean, we, this is a good opportunity to go into why the government might have been so scared that they were sympathetic toward gangsters. Because in addition to being like a mass murdering leader of a crime syndicate, Al Capone did a lot of stuff to improve the local <laughs> communities, especially for poor people. Right. Um, so that's what made him very popular. And a lot of people called him like a Robin Hood-esque figure. So, well, again, it's what we've been talking about. It's talking about the outlaw who's punching upwards. Yeah. Right. Of course, that become. Uh, oh, God. Now it just got Ooh. racist again. Half of them aren't even citizens. And now we're going to get the extra racist thing of the the non-white person who's going to validate your racist opinion by saying they bring disgrace to my people mm. in some sort of accent. Well, anyway. <laughs> But it's, it's interesting you bring that up because uh, that's a good way to sort of articulate it that I was an idiot for not thinking of sooner. It's definitely a Robin Hood thing. And the progression throughout all these gangster movies is going from Robin Hood, but because they're, again, because they are trying to fulfill their image of success that is regulated by capitalism in the first place, they can't actually fight capitalism. They're just fighting the people who are above them at that moment to fill their shoes. Exactly. Yeah. And them helping the poor isn't just like a goodness of heart. It's them just being like, this will keep the people below me from doing what I did to the people above. It's me the before. same thing that he does with his sister in that scene. Yeah. He gives her money to placate her. Yeah. And when she still has her own desire that he is not regulating, he, he gets fucking mad and he <laughs> shoots her husband at that point and his best friend. But this plays Sadie Thompson, uh, I don't know anything about this play, really. Only that I think it was also referenced in 20th Century, if I'm correct, by uh, Howard Hawks in this movie he made about two years after. But of course, this is, again, the thing I'm talking about where Tony has this sense of aesthetics that develops throughout the movie. He's never totally, like, what people would say is, like, competent. He has an element of, like, detachment and, like, naivete that makes his, set, like, sense of taste kind of poor and rugged. Yeah. However, this is the most elaborate it becomes, and this is the most interested in it he becomes. He's no, like, there's no part of him in this moment that is interested in, like, objects in and of him themselves. This is all about him being somebody who is now detached from that blue-collar identity. I mean, look at the way he's dressed. You know? Yeah. He's got the fedora, the classic fedora. Yeah. The suit. And he still has a flower there. Uh. And now he has become very much the image of that gangster that he killed originally. Yeah. To the point where, again, he'd rather stay and do this instead of actually having to engage with the other gangs, right? And even though he's doing something... he. The work he has to do right now is go kill this other gang, right? Awful behavior. Terrible, right? Obvious. Goes without saying. Of course, the fact that he doesn't want to actually alienates us from him further because, again, it's just pure excess. 
it's somehow worse that he's able to be like, should I do it or should I not do it? Eh, I guess I'll do it. I guess I'll go kill these people. You <laughs> I, know what I mean? I, this was this wasn't the scene that I was dying laughing at, but I was just like, <laughs> he forces him to stay there. Yeah, I gotta know which one <laughs> she ends up with. Yeah. And why are you disappointed? That sounds great. You get to stay and finish watching a play and not have the potential to get shot in the face. Yeah. (laughs) Sounds like an A plus thing to me. But does does that make sense? You know, like somehow he becomes even more distanced from us. Well, that's the point. Yeah. It's like he starts off, oh, he's relatable. He's killing this overindulgent fuckhead. And then like you become it. It's a very common morality tale almost. Yeah. And it's something that is definitely, again this is like part of the formula for these gangster movies. Something happens frequently. In fact, I'm going to say almost all the time. (laughs) She's a smart girl. I think of course, another interesting thing that I, I didn't really mention when we had that big scene in the social club where they actually talk about turning it into a business enterprise is how like this movie kind of in our response to that reveals that, the idea of business and capitalism is excessive to begin with. Yeah. Where it's like, Oh, there's the X. Uh, but, but like, think about it, right? What is a business designed to do? Earn profit. So earn a surplus of money. So what? (laughs) So it is naturally excessive because that is the whole point of it is to have the surplus. And we're talking about like on a formal logic level here so like think of it in in terms of in terms of that right so when they turn the gangster thing into into a business thing to make money and make profit it is immediately excessive by the very nature of what a business is does that make sense yeah oh that's such a great shot it you know hawks is very clever at establishing the little visual cues for death in this yeah. like that is so fantastic not only the fact that they he managed to get a perfect strike where it rolls on the, the tip of the pin before it falls over yeah which is cool but just that image is great you get the strike and the final pin falls it's um, awesome it's great and of course we'll say goodbye to boris karloff uh, you your total of 10 lines in the movie will be missed but He's good. I yeah. like him. I mean, you can't not like Boris Karloff. You but. know what he does in this movie, Max? He has to be a recognizable, distinctive character. Not even recognizable. He needs to be distinctive as a different gangster to be as a form of antagonism that they have to overcome. And them overcoming him marks an important shift in this movie because now who else is there for Tony to do battle with? No one. Now the confrontation is going to become more internal. Right? Yeah. We have conquered Chicago, so now what else is there to do? Well, now it's time to fucking kill Lovo. Yes. Steal his women, humiliate him. Yeah. Make him a cuck. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, Ben Hecht, with his amazing screenwriting ability. Originally (laughs) wrote. Oh, what a great little... Oh, just this? Just that. It's like, yeah. it's not even is that she's choosing him over him. It's just like he's taken everything that he has, even though he has like the established, like the lighter, like the classier, more expensive thing. Tony's <laughs> moving on up. He got the matches. He's done it properly. Well, how does that sort of change your, uh, I guess, your opinion of how you relate to Lovo as a character? But like, what was your arc in terms of what you thought of him? Of Lovo? Yeah, Osgood Perkins. I didn't really think much of him, honestly. But in this moment, did you start to feel like a certain type of sympathy for him? Did you think he was going to die? Oh, of course. Okay. Because, like, it's the Godfather. You were like, this is inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I I knew he was going to die the second he was giving, okay, wait, (gasps) we're going to stop talking because this is my my favorite scene in the entire fucking movie. Oh, the way she, like, tries to seduce him or whatever? Yeah. (laughs) The, just the, the, the dancing, the, <laughs> she is amazing. Yeah. She is so fucking charming. It's insane. Yeah. Uh, and I'm glad she was around my age, how old I am right now. 18. Uh, I don't think she was 18 when she started this. I think she was 19. Well, the character's 18. Yeah. <laughs> but oh my point God. is, I don't know how you could not 
this. <laughs> you could not resist. I was this goofy, <laughs> hilarious woman dancing in front of you. And she is beautiful. <laughs> She's beautiful. But yeah. just the, da, 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 da. It's fucking hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> And she's just like, yeah, you like that, right? <laughs> I was like, this feels like it like belongs <laughs> in a modern comedy film. Just like, hey, look at me dancing. <laughs> you know what the I most g- amazing part of it, though, is? Mm. Is that she is playing those notes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know if the movie is 100% aware of that, but she's playing those notes perfectly. Yeah. <sighs> and she's great. And, uh, you know, she's... Oh, God, she's just so charming. She's amazing at using her eyes, by the way. Amazing with her eyes in that moment. Uh, but, yeah, I I really do appreciate her performance in this. And uh, I feel like she's an actor not a lot of people talk about from the 30s. Um, I know that, you know, discussion of actors from, like, the 30s era, classical Hollywood is, you know, at a certain point, depending on what year you're talking about, it gets a little bit, like, hairy because, again, first of all, we don't, have access to all those movies because a lot of them are gone. They don't exist anymore. They were destroyed or we can't find them or whatever. Um, But also because, you know, Hollywood, this is like the first wave of Hollywood and you get like different stars who are stars for a brief period of time and then they kind of like disappear. Like, do people talk about an actor who I enjoy named Kay Francis a lot? She was a big actor and she was in a big movie from this year called Trouble in Paradise directed by Ernst Lubitsch. Yeah. But people don't really talk about Kay Francis that much. (laughs) You know, uh, I know there's like you're just talking about that. I remember it was like a piece of trivia I encountered ordering this movie. There was some famous Hollywood actress. I can't remember her name. She was another blonde in this movie or she might have not been in this movie, but she like appears in one scene and one biographer swears it's her. And another one's like, no, she was in this different movie, so she couldn't have been her. It's like a blood feud between these two biographers of the same one actress in the 1930s. It's like a, a blonde ma- actor, a blonde actress. Was it Mae West? Was it, uh, uh, was it, it doesn't matter. I'm, it was just yeah. like to hammer home your point, like how in depth people get over like yeah. the biographies and lives of these yeah, people. And also because just of the environment of how studios worked at that time, if you're talking biographical details, how much of that shit was just erased for these stars at this point in time, you know? Yeah. It, it also went on into the forties. Definitely, and and still into like the fifties era of classic Hollywood, but definitely like this is where things were. I mean, this was an excessive time, you know. You would perhaps say that Hollywood was was decadent during this period, and again, if we want to go into any more, the undertone of sexual violence and literally everything Tony does in reference to his sister. What did he just do? I think he like poked her in the breast or whatever and her dress is now torn and of course she's got an X on her back (sighs) but yeah she's really great in this and I think she's an important part of emotionally communicating the the reality of Tony's situation you know and it's such a like like I said like I was laughing hysterically in the scene before and just like such a violent switch it is impressive for this to be like her first or one of her first roles, right? That she originally, I don't even think intended to go for or get. And she is now performing this vital function in this movie flawlessly. It's, and you, the, the ability to do that and like fluctuate between like, I'm having this amazing time at this party and I'm the most charming, like joyous, addictive personality you see in this room. And now you are screaming and crying because your weirdo incestuous brother is punching you (laughs) so that's a real like you know pendulum swing to go between those two things and it's very impressive that she's able to do it uh and also i think just to really hammer home the vital importance of that character it's like she is the one who is communicating to us okay not only is he is he going too far and being excessive it's the fact that that's the way he's always been you know so as you're watching this you know that every challenge he comes up across is him confronting himself because that's who he's always been. He's always been that violent, destructive person. So even when he's successful, it's kind of a mirage because eventually he's going to, you know, go back to his destructive behavior in one way or another. Well, that, that's something to go off of that a little. Yeah. That's something that's always, Oh, 
Oh, they wrecked yeah. that those stairs. <laughs> There's some good car chases in this. Yeah, from the 30s. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That's something that's always bothered me about gangster films a lot. Okay. Um, is there's almost like a great Gatsby esque idea to it of just like <laughs> this like sort of almost Randian classism to a degree where it's just like you're not born into the world of the rich and the high rollers. And if you're not, no matter how hard you work, no matter what you do, you're never going to be able to stay there. You have and to reinvent yourself yeah. almost literally. And even yeah. if you do, it's going to be the death of you're you not old to, money. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to be able to chase the dream that but way. But that bothers you? It bothers me that it's reinforcing the idea that like, <laughs> I don't know, like people like, I don't know. It's just, it, it enforces some kind of like classism to me that I'm kind of uncomfortable with. But. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, I, th- I think that's definitely a possibility because it, it sort of consolidates their criminal behaviors into like this o- this underworld that they yeah. exist in. There's very little of them like interacting with like non-criminal society in this. Although we see again some moments of evidence when they start committing crimes in the second half of the movie and you just hear people screaming a little bit. However, uh oh there's a subtle image of a bird in a cage. Um but anyway, the interesting thing about what you're saying there though is I feel like definitely at at the very least in terms of Gadsby I think it's definitely not enforcing that. I think it's more saying that the people who establish that are made impervious by that idea and you cannot, they retreat into their money, so to speak. Right. And that no matter what they do, no matter what mayhem they cause, whether they they destroy people's lives, uh, they will always be impervious because of the power of money and how it allows them to retreat to this Edenistic, you know, psychological state where they are guilty of nothing. Um, and I think there's something I, you definitely could compare this movie to the great Gatsby in that way. I mean, literally down to lines of him being like, Oh, I've got different colored shirts. Ha ha ha. And it's very much the same idea. I mean, okay. Literally. How does Gatsby get his wealth? Bootlegging. Yeah. With uh Wolfsheim or whatever that guy's name is who again, Meyer Wolfsheim is his name. Does that sound like a proper waspy name? No. No. So again, playing very much in the same idea as Max. I think that's an important connection. Um, You have like this crossroads of class, money, business, and then race sort of happening in the gangster genre and in in, uh, The Great Gatsby. Um, And maybe the thing to really unite these two things is like looking at Okay, how how are they different as like responses to the twenties? I guess. Um, I mean, both of them are a very Icarus type thing. Where it's just, yes, you flew too close to the sun, mm, and then you you fall. Um, which is what again, Max? Excessive desire. Yeah, leading to your doom. Yeah. Hey, everybody retrospectively, go back and take a shot every time we use the word excessive. excess. You'll be excessively drunk. <laughs> Is it possible or excessive. excessively dead? Yeah, I was gonna say, you'll be excessively not alive. <laughs> yeah. You'll be extra dead. Yeah. And you know what else is interesting if you're gonna talk about the structure of this movie? We have this moment, right? And uh if we're talking about going full circle, having destroyed all the other competition, now we're going to the part where the struggle becomes internal. We have that party sequence, right? Followed by a sort of after party sequence. And again, he encounters his sister with someone else and gets mad. But then we're back at the barber shop, which also f- followed directly after the party sequence the first time at the beginning of the movie. So now it's like we're gearing up again for a different cycle, right? And now the movie is going to change. And uh, it becomes a little bit more reflective and introspective on everything going on um, because all these characters have a history with one another now. And this is a very interesting scene. I think it's it's a very good scene to put at this point in the movie because, like I was just saying, it's sort of the movie is changing the form of drama that you expect. And suddenly in this moment, he survived getting shot up, right? But yeah. in this movie that's been incredibly, um, I don't want to say blatant, but it's embraced being explicit about all the action that's going on, right? And being excessive and being like, 
when Tony says something, he's going to tell you, this is what I want, you know, and this is how I'm going to go about doing it. And I'm not going to hide, you know, as a character, there's not as much nuance the way he expresses himself to others. But now suddenly he is going to ro- rely on like some trickery on some uh, dissembling in order to actually figure out whether or not Lovo was the one who called in the hit on him. And he does it in a very clever way. And uh, just this type of drama, I think, is a good thing to bring in at this point in the movie when, uh, you, you know, it might be a little bit easier to get fatigued from the same thing over and over again. <laughs> and of course, the other interesting thing about the way he goes about this scene is that this is the first kill scene that is going to become personal in a way that all the ones that have preceded it are not. You know, this one is, this one is about business, sort of. Right. But more so than business, the scale is tipping. This is personal. Right. Lovo tried to kill him and now Tony must destroy him. You know, it's this is about revenge as much yeah. as it is about any sort of and business. Despite thing. the fact that he's been the head of this crime enterprise, he's been <laughs> the one ordering kills. And yeah, Tony's gone beyond what he said, but like, yeah. He's still terrified for his own death. He's shaking. Yes. Yeah, so and now drink. he's he's whistling the, the tune from that opera that I've forgotten the name to, which I'm sure you could read some sort of intertextuality into. So look that up, people. He whistles in this scene, and then the scene when he first kills somebody, he whistles a tune from an opera. Um, And of course, the other thing about what you're saying, though, is like, okay, is Lovo the one actually in charge at this point? No. No, he's not. He hasn't been since the time he got, yeah, Tony got the machine gun. Yeah. And symbolically, we've seen that, like, in a very visual way with who Poppy sided over. Yeah. If you want to be able to afford Poppy, you have to be the one in charge, right? And now he's going to punch through the the window in the door the same way that he threw the stone through the social club uh, door, and now he's going to kill him. And uh, again, like we've just said, there's really no need to kill him at this point from a business perspective, right? He's already beaten the shit out of him, right? Except now... He's going he's gonna to destroy him. He's killed the people who are willing to work with him to try to kill Tony, so they're not a problem anymore. The only thing left is Lobo. No. And this is uh, the image that I think they took for the uh, one sheet of the movie. It's him punching this guy or grabbing him by the hair. Man, but he's adapting the behavior of the people that he's hated now. Mm-hmm. This is the first time. That's important you mention that, too, because just yeah. as this one becomes more personal all of a sudden, this is the first time he doesn't actually kill him on his own. And he actually has his number two guy come in and do it. And now he's finally able to take possession of Poppy. Something that I feel was, like, slightly spoiled for him by the fact that... <laughs> The boss, like, basically was just like, you can have her, it's fine, whatever. So she was an obtainable possession, something he would have had to take by force. Right. Uh, But also, I have to ask myself, if we're looking at, like, the Hegelian, or not Hegelian structure of this, but if we're going back to that Oedipal idea, part of the possession of woman as, like, an assertion of agency and selfhood mm -hmm. and uh, creating your own identity comes with, like, the ability to, what, kill dad, you know? So, like... In him destroying him, it is very much an emotional thing, and it makes sense to have this scene where he confronts Poppy as something that follows immediately after he disposes of Lovo, because this is what this should be for him is the completion of that, right? Yeah. Where it's like, okay, come on, Dal, we're fi- you're finally free. Let's yes, go. Yes, I have take acquired the, the mother, and I have disposed of the father who is competing with me for her. Only now it's this weird scene in low key lighting and he's just peering out the window and he's going to stare up back at the sign again. Right. The world is yours. Yeah. And it becomes this weird, ironic thing where it's like visually this is depressing and drab and nothing about this feels good on an emotional level when you're watching this. So again, it is him in a certain sense, accomplishing the thing he wants to, but never actually achieving it. And again, that's another sort of uh, dichotomy that this movie and gangster movies play with is the difference between success and happiness and how like 
you know, gangsters, like we've said, they exist on out on the outside of society because they break all its rules, but they only do so in order to achieve things that society says are images of success. So are they actually happy for doing it? I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> that outfit is uh, pretty snazzy, I'm going to say. I was wondering when I saw this, if this is what inspired the origami cop and Blade Runner. This? Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I wouldn't say so. I would say um, the thing I thought of watching that was like, I was thinking like in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, the way in which the steel beam has all the X's connected to one another and yeah. that you have that is kind of similar. I'm 18, though. I'm 18. I'm old enough to get married. Well, back in this day, died of dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one of the worst ways to die, maybe. That app still happened in the 30s, right? Oh, you mean dysentery? Yeah. I mean, as far as I know, it still happens now. Didn't, didn't the entire cast of Titanic get dysentery because they were in that, like, bad, <laughs> like, Baja, California water or whatever? No, that was just... From uh, being around James Cameron for too long. It's a natural <laughs> it side of contaminates effect. the water around him. Um, maybe he, he's evil. Maybe that's why he makes all those movies with water. <laughs> he's trying to contaminate the that's, world. That's going to be the thing. Make is us like, shit ourselves. You yeah, know, James Cameron is actually some sort of elder being from the, <laughs> the abyss. <laughs> he warned us. He said he's king of the world. Uh, by the way, since you've mentioned uh, dysentery and shit, have you ever seen the movie Dreamcatcher? <laughs> No, I haven't. Directed by Lawrence Kasdan. I saw that two weeks ago, and it is so incredibly terrible and baffling. There are aliens in that movie that also it's fucking gross. They're so like, there's so much gastrointestinal like, oh, God, I hate it. Um, But the aliens in that movie come out of people's assholes. Yeah. (sighs) I don't yes, no. Are you, this is not entertaining to you, the idea of like people being constipated and then they shit out an alien that like then kills them. You don't like this? No. That sounds like a terrible movie. It's a Stephen King uh, adaptation. Of course it is, because Stephen King has had two good ideas in the past 30 years and the rest of them are weird and bizarre. Oh, don't say that. People are going to come after you. Okay, then go for it. <laughs> <laughs> And the only reason people like it is because you've only seen the yeah the movie version that's been trimmed down 800 pages. You don't have to see rambling about child gangbangs and world turtles. Max, I like turtles. Do you like the fact that the turtle is the universe and when it shits, it's a clown? And is it actually its shit? What is with him and shit <laughs> and aliens and shit? It's like... We probably don't know what we're talking about, but I'm going to say that Stephen King has a thing with shit. That's what I'm going to say. It's like all the negative parts of the universe turtle was like shit out into one little part of Maine. That That's it. But well, that says a lot about Maine, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> Here we have Ann Warshak playing piano and uh, being very charming, as usual. Like I said before, this movie, the only thing that I have is that it has an excess of excess where <laughs> there are some things where it's just like you ever listen to that band in excess no bam 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 you don't know that song <laughs> sorry i was thinking of another one what's the dust oh wow we're really falling apart right now we are let's talk about this scene <laughs> what is there to talk about <laughs> Well, so, this is the scene is like right now. Charged. We're, right now, we're just waiting for the end of the film to happen. Basically, no, we're like, not. There's lots of interesting things that are still going to happen. This scene is great. I mean, we didn't talk about the fact of the song she was singing. Do you want to talk about that? Again, that's another moment of farce and innocence, right? That's really the main thing that uh, Robin Wood discusses in his essay when he's talking about the important like comedic aspects of this. Is how the comedy. Oh, got, oh my God! It's an X and on the another door. X. How many X's are there? Who knows how many X's there are? (laughs) But yes, so uh, the interesting thing about this, if we're going to mention that, is, uh, again, the... uh, Oh, he's going to drop that coin. 
But again, the, uh, the way she was singing contrasted with what actually happens in this moment. Robin Wood discusses in his essay about how the comedic sort of slapstick elements are important because they retain an idea of innocence for the characters and uh, about how like that plays into an idea of um, how this works as a morality tale. We have the intrusion of the newspaper editor who yells at us and says that this is bad in the middle of the movie. But aside from that, the movie doesn't really graft morality and judgment onto the characters. Does that make sense? Yeah. But what it does do is that it forces the characters into situations where they have to judge themselves empirically. Does that make sense? Like, it's not saying, like, it's not having a character come in and be like, this is bad or whatever. Or it doesn't force the characters to be bad. It just sets them up with these desires and allows the situation to take its course. But what happens is that the Tony eventually realizes the uh, the terrible nature of his own desires. And sort of what's happening in this scene is very significant. And again, is the most interesting part of why, like, Anne Vorschach's character is emotionally vital for this movie is because when he kills his like best friend, right? His right hand man. Yeah. His go to guy. Okay. It's almost like he is now he has now reached the point where he is too excessive even for himself. And now he is empirically realizing something about himself. And what that is is he he is recognizing the most excessive and uncomfortable desire that he's been pursuing in this entire movie, which is possession of his sister. Yeah. Because again, just as his interaction with Poppy in the beginning of the movie is the same thing when he meets Lovo, when we meet Lovo, and then it's linked with the scene where we're introduced to Anne Vorschach as his sister, the scene where he kills Lovo to then take possession of Poppy. And then the scene where he kills his right hand man to take possession of his sister are once again linked at the end of the movie as well. But now that link, again, the excessiveness of that desire is something that he can no longer disavow and not acknowledge, which is why he's like so fucked up when he does that, because he now just did something where he has crossed a boundary and. And uh, he, no, he's not no telephone, innocent. man, he never learned how to read or use a telephone, but he'll try right before he dies. Again, another weird moment, a lot of this movie, because again, this movie uh, is very much about people who are quote unquote normal Americans who just do normal American things, but outside the law. Right. I want to compare this movie to like the idea of it just being businessmen for a second. Okay. And how that's something you can look at throughout this entire movie. Right. It would be very similar structurally if they were just businessmen. But of course the fact of them being gangsters kind of flips that on its head. So you have similarity, but it's a little bit different. So it kind of in some ways plays as like a type of satire or irony in everything that happens because it is so similar to what is socially acceptable. And that also comes out in the comedic moments, including this, he's going to die, but he's still not going to be able to answer the phone or he's going to get the name. Right. But then he dies before he could say it. Um, there's a sense of irony that this movie has about almost everything and how they move up in the world. That event like comes from the idea of this, this, uh, gangster. Oh, he does get the name. It's Poppy. He finally did it right, but now he's going to die. But again, all of this stems from that concept of the gangster movie as like a more ironic flip or inversion of the idea of what it means to pursue the American dream. They're doing all the same things everyone else are doing, only it's terrible because... It's terrible and thus comic for its similarity, you know? Yeah. Oh, he doesn't know how to use a phone either. (laughs) And again, that line, I didn't know. That's something that Wood points out as like a vital moment in sealing the doom of this character because it's like he's now reached a level of awareness that makes him guilty compared to being innocent, you know? He's now come to the conclusions about his, be- his own behavior. And because he would condemn himself, that is why it is now fit for these awful cops that we don't like to come and shoot him. Well, yeah, we kind of forgot about the cops for like a good two thirds of the movie almost. Right. Like after he's taken control, the cops are just like, eh, whatever. And of course the thing about at this point in the movie is like, do we still have sympathy? F- do we have sympathy for the cops at this point? 
I don't really know. We don't, I don't even view the cops as human. They're sort of non-characters. Yeah. They're like a presence, but they're, they're set up as assholes as like a foil to help establish sympathy for Tony. Right. And then the movie just becomes about Tony, but then somehow they feel as like a counterbalance, you know, they, they become a cosmic force that is going to restore balance after he has pursued excess desire way too far. Right. And, uh, at the very least, I suspect that, you know, definitely audiences would be on of the opinion that Tony at this point is ready to be killed yeah. for his behavior, even yeah. if it is done by a force that we well, also don't like, like. His little sister is going to marry his best friend and or married his best friend. And it was going to be wholesome. He'd finally be right. like she tried to like his insane wishes of just like, oh, I don't want you out in town and mix him with every boy you find. And so it's like okay, well, I'll find a boy I really like and I've been trying to win over the entire movie and we'll get married and then we'll be legitimate and pure that way, but no, yeah. still not enough. Because again, it's it's the excessive desire and that is the most icky, <laughs> the, the most icky example of it, you know, is the incest in this. And of course, I think it's a great call for them to have Amvorshak show up again, in this climactic moment, right? But also to have her not shoot him because that also feels a little bit too moralizing and simple, you know? <sighs> that feels a little bit too much like justice has been served, you know? It's going to be even worse than that because she's going to get shot again as a function of just being near him. And he's going to be responsible for that too. Oh no, they bought in the old time. Oh fire. God, they brought the... Lights mm. send in the grips. And what do you think about this trope in gangster movies? Or do you, what, you want to go down in a blaze of glory? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's sort of just like, it depends on how it's done. I think it definitely springs from, again, that same dichotomy we've been discussing where it's an individual versus society sort of thing. And maybe we can we can bring this back full circle to like comparing the the myth making of the gangster to the like the myth making of Western outlaws. And we talked over the scene um, where they actually have that discussion in this movie. The police officer talks about like, oh, at least in the past you could sort of respect a Western outlaw because yeah. The reason he talks about it is like, oh, they just met at at sundown in the street and shot each other, and their business was done. Of course, the way he discusses it is like, what is he talking about? Oh, he's talking about excess. Again, the outlaws were not excessive. They did it as a function of living and not to fulfill some sort of capitalist urge to buy whatever, to buy robes or something, you know? <sighs> See, this is the weird thing for me, though. Okay. I think it kind of deflates the movie a bit. Okay, well, we do have a very powerful death scene here. But, but what deflates it? Deflates it is the adding of the incestuous tone. Like if you just had him be an overprotective brother who was just like, almost like a, how in the Godfather movies, you have the father who doesn't want his youngest son to get into the mafia life because he wants right. one of them to be legitimate. Yes. Like if it was a similar thing here where it's just like, I know I was overprotective. I know I was an asshole and hypocritical. It's because I wanted you to be pure and have a good life. Right. But then Definitely. that makes him too noble. Does it though? Because yeah. would you consider the characters in The Godfather too noble? Like, well, The Godfather, I think, is a different approach to this type of character. I Whereas guess. Don Corleone, part of the reason he's killed is because he's too noble. He is yeah. too noble. That's why they have to take him out. Because again, he is. What is he doing? He's re he's rejecting the the demands of capitalism in that sense, and he wants to try to have an aspiration towards something better, and thus he has to be eliminated. Whereas in this it is more of a morality story just about this one character, you know, and less so about the dynamic of a family. And uh, I think the thing that you're talking about, though, brings it more to a purely, like, tragic dimension, which is, again, why that first Godfather movie, movie is definitely has a strong tragic element. Yes. Because and it, and it rests in that amazing scene in the hospital, right, where suddenly there's a flip in that scene. That scene is one of the best scenes of film history, where Michael walks into the hospital because he knows they're going to come for his dad, right? And he doesn't want to get involved either. So he walks into the hospital just looking to, like, see his dad and save his dad. But the thing is, you can't do that without a political implication, right? 
Yeah. So in the same act, it forces him to actually become involved in the family. And he cannot, he has to choose between actually doing, doing this thing to save his dad as a purely personal thing or not getting involved because that's the synthesis of like, okay, now your personal life, you are part of the family. You can't go back from this point. And it's tragic because all he wants to do is save his dad. And that's a very relatable personal thing, but he can't escape from it. So that movie is far more tragic than this one. Whereas, you know, this is more about, it is tragic, but it's also about how he's going to destroy himself. And again, invent him an image of himself that is going to be destroyed. You know, he's very much about surface level things and about like identities is sort of like in a third person sort of way. He's like, again, to compare it to Gatsby, he has to reinvent his whole identity, right? He's inventing himself as this new type of uh, criminal, this gangster. But I guess the thing I was going to mention in terms of comparing this to Western movies is how the giant climactic showdown is also something that you see in Western movies sometimes, but it's a little bit different because I think it's inherently a little bit more optimistic in Westerns. The good guy always wins. Well, not simply that, but like if you're playing with the like back and forth of like individual versus society in this, the gangster is very much an individual trying to rebel against society, but the conclusion is always that they can't because the gangsters are still operating within the realm of capitalism, even if they weren't or are not operating within the law, you know? Yeah. So they can't escape society. So ultimately they're going to end up confronting it to the point of destroying themselves in a blaze of glory. Whereas the Western doesn't always have to end that way, even if they get shot because it's like the Western is, is more of an open space for those outlaws. There can be violence and you will come into contact with like representatives of society, but it's more of an unmade space. And it's more about like, how are we going to decide what society is instead of, this is what society is and you're breaking the rules and, and we're going to take you down. And he ended up in the gutter. Yep. Well, unfortunately he didn't comically fought. Yeah. Landed in a pile of horse shit, but um, <laughs> what that's early on. is just like, you're going to land with your head oh. in the gutter where uh, a horse had been standing. Yeah. And here we have this very blatant final shot. But apparently again, there is an alternate ending for this movie. Oh, okay. That was even, that was like literally implemented after Hayes, like had the hissy fit over it. Well, not Hayes. Well, it, whoever it was, I, I don't know. I believe it was Hayes at the time, but... um, I don't know if that's true. I don't okay. know if there's a person named Hayes. I believe it was. Whatever will. it is. Yeah. Somebody is... Their hair is on fire right now. But um, he... Uh, there was a scene where the cops actually did arrest him and put him on trial, and then he was hanged. And then a judge just chastised him. Yeah, to, like, to just show, just like, look, the justice system works. Yes. Which is... Ugh. Oh, it's much better that he dies. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was nervous because I had read that when I was reading information. And then yeah. the version I watched, I, like, I saw him go to the hand close. I'm like, oh, no, I'm not watching that version. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully, I don't think it's widely available or you have to go out of your way to find it. And Fortunately, so, though, you can find this movie somewhat readily. Yeah. We watched this online, but I'm sure there's a good home video. It's on YouTube it somewhere. Oh, well, yeah. here you go. For, for it's, on, it's not even like a choppy, like separated thing. It's free with ads on YouTube. Oh, that's so, interesting. Yeah. Huh. I wonder, this is a universal version we watched where they own the rights clearly, but again, it was produced independently, so maybe there's some weird thing with the rights. Yeah, and it's also, I don't know, but yeah. But yeah, so this has been Scarface. I'm really glad we did this movie. I had fun with it. Yeah, and I think there's a lot to mine here in terms of just content and thinking about it, and it's just so great to watch. It's just so so many fun, like, aesthetic things. Um, it's a fantastic Howard Hawks movie, uh, yeah. And I'm definitely, I can't tell you when, but this is definitely a movie that I return to from time to time. Yeah. Um, I just really enjoy this movie and, uh, I think I just go back to it a little bit more frequently than some of the other, you know, gangster movies. Maybe we'll do some more gangster movies at some point. In there the is an evolution of that genre at, you know, at different points in time that are interesting. So I have to be in a certain mood for them, but yeah, definitely it's something I'd return to. And yeah, you know me, I like, I like to chastise you for making me watch movies close to a hundred years old a lot of the time, but, um, definitely, but there are ones that I thoroughly enjoy and this is definitely one of them. Yeah. So, so two thumbs up from us. So yeah, this has been the Spectator Film Podcast. You can find us online at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or on iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher. And Max, any final words? Yeah, see? Again, again? We didn't do nearly enough of it during the recording. (laughs) I had to make up for lost time. All right. You're sleeping with the fishes. (laughs) 